We filmed this makeover of Sophie's garden over 20 years ago. We started off with the triangular plot. It was mainly grass, but there was also a little bit of hard standing next to a garage. We wanted to create a garden for three lively young boys and their mother, Sophie. So we shoehorned into this space a treehouse, a wildlife pool, a sunken trampoline, and a large area for entertaining. This is the first of two videos. I hope you enjoy it. Sophie and her sons want to create the perfect family garden. So I went to Woolerton, Nottingham to help them redesign their plot. First job was to shift all the existing concrete with the help of friends and family. Then the building work began for the main item on Sophie's wish list, a huge sunken patio area. Next job was to dig a hole for a giant trampoline to sit in, thereby making it flush with the ground. As the lads dug the hole, the framework was assembled. And with the trampoline in place, it was time for the arrival of the boys' treehouse. The treehouse is the major construction job in the boys' area and called for the help of our team of chippies. Well, Matthew, this is the tree. Yeah. Nice little hawthorn tree. Yes, it is. Maximum height of the treehouse is four metres because we can't get planning permission here, so that's the maximum we can go to. Because the tree was so lightweight, this was to be a freestanding treehouse and that meant building a sturdy frame. Can you come across a bit more, please? Right, come back to, back to you two inches. With a timber frame, everything works on 90 degrees and 45 degrees. So uh, the post holes have basically got to be in exactly the right position um, or else the problems just get worse the higher up you go. How long is the treehouse going to take, Bonnie? How long is it going to take to build? I reckon it'll take about seven hours. Seven hours of everybody working flat out, including you. We always use uh, green oak for this type of construction. This means it's been cut just from the log, it's freshly cut. You can get kiln dried, which is dried by a uh, machine, or you can get air dried, which is dried naturally over a space of time. It normally takes about a year per inch on that. It goes a lovely uh, grey colour after a period of two or three years. We're using bolts to uh, fix it together where the more traditional method would be to drill and whack oak pegs into them. Both are very, very strong. Um, the coaching bolts will look nice from the other side and of course they're galvanised for the last few years. At around £500 for the raw materials, this green oak is a lot less expensive than the dried oaks. But you can just as easily use softwood pressure treated posts at a fraction of the cost. We concreted the posts 800 millimetres into the ground as this treehouse is going to see a lot of action. I'm going to go on the treehouse every day. Then, and on three, two, one. And down. As you can see, Bunny, with the braces, you follow the grain with the branch. These are cut out of wider section and you take your arch that way. Yeah. So you're retaining the strength, but of course it just gives a nice detail. Nice curve. Yeah. I've done that using softwood planks, but not lovely no. bits of oak like you yeah, used right. before. The, 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 it's, it's strong enough, you know, really without, but it, it just adds to everything. And it stops the verticals looking like posts, doesn't exactly. it? It gives it a bit more character, exactly. I think. And of course, you know, over the years, it is going to move. It's going to shrink slightly. And with all the braces in place, it's just not going to move as mm. a structure. With the boys keeping an eye on things, I took the opportunity to slink off for a bit of welcome R&R &R, and happily found myself in the capable hands of Sophie's highly skilled cousin Jasmine. Oh, it makes all the goose puppies go up, you know, that feeling, I love it. 
You're working her too hard. She's got too much knots. <laughs> <laughs> She's got the strongest hands ever. <laughs> Meanwhile, the treehouse was shaping up nicely. I'm not sure about the colour bunny. Well, it looks very white when you put it on initially, doesn't it? And we don't want to put too much on, but it does actually fade to a nice antique grey and it will look more like the oak. The natural oak looks fabulous and we'll leave that as it is, maybe put a bit of warm linseed on it or something. Yeah. But this we want to protect a bit because it's only softwood and I hate this greeny colour when it's pressure treated. So it's really to disguise that and make it look more faded and aged. Right. What about the doors? Well, I think it'd be nice to punch the doors out, do the doors and window and paint them in a different colour, something a bit more interesting. And I wanted about a sort of greeny colour. You can have my brush in a minute, I'll tell you. I'll be very pleased to hand it to you. I'll just do this panel and you can do the next one, okay? So if we do the doors and the window in a nice greeny colour, yeah. olivey green, which will go well with the trees and the canopy, then I think that will look really nice. Yeah, it will do. Yeah. <laughs> the main body of the treehouse was made from 12mm marine ply panels. This provided strength and durability but for appearance's sake, the panels were clad with soft wood boards. Can you rear your end up? Get it up as a straight piece. So it's right, Alison, now right it straight up. So it's parallel. The window doors were cut in a shape of a Gothic arch with a trellis window in a side panel to match. Both would be glazed with acrylic sheeting so that come rain or shine, the boys would be cosy in their new den. My eyes are up. <laughs> but it looks so good. I think the kids are going to be banished to the house. That's my area. Mum, that's your living area. That's mine. We're going to fight about this one. The front of the treehouse was finished with off cuts of logs, a simple but effective cladding. We've still got a few finishing touches to do on the tree house. I've got wonderful finials to come on the post, some door furniture for the door and the trellis, but the boys are dying to come and have a quick look at it. So what do you think? Wicked! With the boys content with their tree house, it was time to get on with Mum's patio. This was a large paved area, and because of that, I wanted to break up the slabs with small clay paviors. Quite a transformation going on here. Brilliant. Mm, what do you think of the paving pattern? The paving is absolutely lovely. It, I just love the white steps. They're yeah. Brilliant. It's just useful, especially around an area like this. If suddenly loads of people come, then you've got all this extra sitting area. Yeah. Very handy. I will have a lot of people come. <laughs> Steve, how's the timber? Fine. Obviously, it won't last as long as a brick coping, but we should get, what, 12, 15 years out of it? Oh, definitely, yeah. It just looks a load warmer, don't you think? It than does, brick yeah. on the top. And it's much more bottom friendly as well. M much nicer to sit on. <laughs> I hope so. This um, gap here, which you've left out. Yeah. Um, I thought a mosaic might be quite nice. But are you feeling creative? I am. Um, yeah. If you're feeling creative, that's no problem. I wanted Sophie's mosaic to blend in softly with the rest of the garden, so I used natural tile ends and broken terracotta pots. I'd thrown these into a cement mixer with some sand for a couple of hours to tumble off any rough edges. I thought we'd do a band all the way around the edge of those nice Collie Western stone tiles. So there is a, it's a stone which comes from part of Lincolnshire. 
and they're used for roofs. They look lovely on the roofs. They're sort of honey coloured. And these are just the offcuts that they right. chuck away when they make them. So I thought we'd bed them end in. And if we alternate, so we have some big and some small. To bed the mosaic in, we used a semi-dry four-in-one sand cement mix, taking care to protect the surrounding paving as it can permanently stain it. Harder than it looks. It's not easy. We've only just started, so we get the hang of it. I've been expert then. <laughs> the Prince of Wales had one in part of his garden, and he had his feathers done in all tiles on end. And that okay. looked really nice. Yes. Oh, you got a little bit fit in there. Well done. Yeah. Because the mosaic is small scaled compared to the rest of the paving, it's important to ensure that the gaps in between the tiles are kept to a minimum. The closer, the better. The border of the clay paviors gave us a perfect inside edge to work to, and once we'd worked our way round, we were ready to start filling in. I worked out this design on paper and I thought we'd do a zigzag band all the way around the edge like that. And then, when we've got all these lovely triangles, we can then fill them in with different things. It's reminiscent of doing jigsaw puzzles, isn't it? Quite therapeutic in a way, isn't it? Or uh, well, tedious, I'm not sure well. Mm -hmm. One or the other. To finish off our patio centrepiece, we used five Boxer Sempervirons, more commonly known as box balls. Box is a hungry feeder, but as the patio had been laid to a central fall, they would never go short of water. How do I look after these, Emboni? The main thing, I suppose, is keeping their shape. Right. So um, you'll need to clip them up each year. If you clip them too early, you'll find that they'll grow and then the frost comes and kills off all their new growth and they look really manky. So the best time to clip them is in about June-ish. But it's a really nice job. Isn't there a disease that these get, Bunny? Yes, there is. There's um, box disease, which has come over, I think, probably from Holland. Yeah. And it's really bad in the west part of the country, where it's much wetter because it doesn't like the damp. Wow. It goes all yellowy and whitey, the leaves die back. Yeah. And if you see any sign of that, then cut it out, burn it. And then when you've used your secateurs on that one, disinfect them before using it on any others. Yeah. I think you'll be okay, mainly because these are the big box. These are box the Sempervirens, and it's the little box, the dwarf box, the Fruticosa, which is more, it's much, much more common on. The shape that we put the box is in a pattern of a five on a dice, which is called a quincunx. And that's a really old medieval pattern. It's one of my favorites. It will look nice in the winter or the summer, all year round. Not a lot of maintenance, quite simple. It just makes the patio just look so complete. It just really sets it off lovely. It just finishes it and just looks absolutely gorgeous. Our next job was to dig out a natural wildlife pond in the boys' new play area. Let's have a 700 mil path on the side and then that better be the edge there. So that's the back edge of our shelf. Go from there to there. But a nice natural line. That's fine. It's going to be two foot deep. It's going to be like that. This is, a, this, this is the closest I've ever been to that Boys, he'll move it into a pile, then he'll move it all back. This is one of the most important bits. Because we're going to put a liner in to hold all the water, we don't want any of these stones on the edge to actually puncture the liner. And as soon as you put a load of water in it, it puts a lot of pressure on the liner and these stones will make a hole. And then all our hard work, and it will disappear into the ground. So we'll put an underlay under the polythene to help protect it. But even so, we want to be doubly, doubly sure. So we can just go around the edge and pick out all these sharp stones. Okay, and we'll put them in a bucket. Whew. Is that heavy, Jake? Should we put it down here? 
Well done, thank you very much. This is the underlay and we're going to put this on the soil and we're going to put the waterproof liner on top of this and then we'll put another layer on top as well and that will really protect from anything on top puncturing it. It's different kind of textiles. It side. is, it's got this shiny surface which has to go next to the liner and this non-shiny surface on the bottom. I think it's made from old clothes, isn't it? Old shoddy. Right, that's lovely. Let's roll it back. Old carpet, underlay or even newspapers will protect the liner just as well. But when you're laying it, do be careful not to disturb the soft edges. Don't do that unnecessarily, Jake, because it will just erode the sides. Find the edges, Jake. With the liner in place and another protective layer on top, bricks were used to hold everything in place. We shoveled topsoil in to form planting beds and then it was time to fill her up. Ooh, what a mess. If you, I think if you lay it down, it'll just go in really slowly well, and it, yeah. gently and it won't make much of a mud pile. It'll take about 24 hours to settle, but it's nice to see the water coming in at last, isn't it? Yeah. How long? Mm, an hour. Two hours. Two hours. Look how slow the water's going. Going fast. It's like filling up a big, massive bath. What, what if I jump in? You won't. There'll be a grid over it. Mm -hmm. Our pond needed to be 600 millimetres deep in order to achieve a good natural balance. So, to make it safe, we used a specially designed grid system. Tell me how this safety system works, Roland. Well, it's a system of grids and supporting beams which go into the garden pond. They fit any pond. The grids themselves clip on top of the beams. We have child-proof clips which keep them on top, which means that they are safe for children. Children won't take the grids off. And it means I can take them off when I want to thin out my plants or get yes. the fish? Yes, yep, they just unclip simply and then you can get into any part of the pond that you need to and then just clip it back in again when you've done Lovely. what you need to do. Nice and light and easy to work with, but really strong. Very strong. They're made out of a toughened black plastic and they sit just below the water surface. So they're very discreet, especially with a black liner, they practically disappear. And if you've got lily pads and plants going through them, you wouldn't know they were there would you? No that's right and it, it means that there's a good happy compromise so that pond life can still exist and mm. it's still safe. Uh, we've got some lovely pebbles here now what do we do with these do you reckon? Um, put them in with the plants. Yeah, we're going to put them on that edge, I reckon, because they'll look really nice. And we've got these beautiful big boulders and we'll have all pebbles. So like a beach, it will create a beachy effect around these two sides. And then on those sparsy sides, we'll have lots of plants. Ooh, try not to lose too many in the water. The water's going to come up, you see. So keep them on this top edge. Dirtier and dirtier, Jake. You're going to be one big ball of mud in a couple of hours. This comes a really exciting bit of the pool. Now we're going to put in these lovely marginal plants. Well, like, yeah. mm -hmm. What's a marginal plant? Marginal plants are the plants that live on the water margins, basically. So they all live in this zone here, which will be damp, but it'll have soil. And sometimes it'll be under the water and sometimes it won't, depending on the weather. And they love that sort of habitat. And then things like the frogs and the dragonflies and things can fly around, lay eggs around them, and then the larvae can crawl up on their leaves and things. You always see them in natural areas of water, don't you? And these are all native ones. They're all ones that occur in this country. Oh, you can start digging them. <laughs> So this is a marsh marigold. These are lovely plants that grow in sort of wet, boggy areas and on the margins of water. 
And they had this fabulous flower, didn't they? Really nice. And they all spread and they all form really nice big clumps. We were putting quite a few in them. They'll slowly thicken up each year and they'll get bigger and better. And so they'll you increase. All of them in one big area? Or? I thought we'd put them in nice big groups, like three or four or five of each, like they would occur naturally. No baskets needed here. The plants can simply be placed into the soil. Now that one, before you shove it in water, look at its bottom. Have a look at its bottom. Full of roots because it's been in there for too long. So let's give the roots a start and tease them out with our fingers. They're quite tough because they're native plants. They're no wee fairies. You know, they'll get in and they'll get going, but you want to give them the best possible start. Yeah, well done. Upside down, bit of pressure. Why? Nah, those need really teasing out. Well, you lot disappeared when it started to rain hard and we finished it off, but it's done now. What do you reckon? I can't wait. I can't wait until um, wildlife starts coming in. Yeah, I reckon you'll probably find that birds and things will start drinking from it in a couple of days. And then in a few months, I think you'll find frogs and newts, dragonflies next summer. And all these marginals we've planted, they'll really fill out. So this time next year, it'll look a lot greener. And of course, we're going to finish it off. We're going to put wild shrubs all the way around the edge. And we've turfed the rest of the garden. It will all start to look really nice. It'll really come together. Really? Hey, can I put a few snails in to give it a hair start? Very good idea. Water snails, I hope, are they? <gasps> Fabulous. Let's just put them gently in. They've got a nice new home to live in. How many have you got there? Eight. 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 Let's put them in. That's lovely. Well, that's the first start to our wildlife garden. And I hope they all find it a great place to live. We hope so too. <laughs> Yay!